Okay, so, um, thank, hey, Whimsy, thanks for being here uh, for our second Curators Codex. Um, one of our mission commitments is um, Friday Arts Project is to curate conversation. In other words, we want to encourage interaction uh, about the arts and those things uh, related. Actually, we'll be doing my next talk on this particular section, um, talking and making art, which is two commitments that we have in our mission, uh, mission statement. Anyway, one of the events that we came up with about curating conversation was this, um, this event called uh, Curator's Codex, uh, which we sub, what do you call it, subtitle? Sub Tagline. Tagline. Thank you, my design wife. Tagline, select conversations in the arts. So just to have content as a way of, of presenting it to our community. And it was designed to have uh, an artist, an academic, or an advocate to speak on topics related to the arts in our community and beyond, um, just to get an idea of what's going on. Now, we have done a few of these over the years, but uh, more recently, we haven't been doing them as much on a consistent basis, but, uh, but it's always been in our arsenal to use. And uh, in fact, Daniel did one during our lockdown time. So uh, then over the last year or so, I've had some conversations with people in our community and um, other individuals, leaders in the arts, uh, one of them even uh, Melanie Cooper over there at the Arts Council. And there's something that began, began to emerge um, about related to the arts in our community and, and the culture in general. And in those interactions, uh, we wanted to attempt a few public conversations at some point this year. Melanie and I have been talking about it. We haven't set um, specific dates, but they all happen sometime either later this fall or definitely next winter, spring, uh, uh, just to do conversations about the arts in public and uh, interact with people <coughs> about the importance of the arts. Um, as we get more information on that, you can look at our social media. But in the meantime, we thought, um, I actually thought, why not try some dialogues in uh, Curator's Codex this year? And so here we are. I, uh, I wanted to be, to complement that mindset of, of being more, um, I don't know, advanced or initiative oriented towards uh, a defense of arts. And uh, so that's why um, I'm taking these, who's that, is that my, it, taking these, um, these opportunities. What better way than a short series on the defense of the arts? So here we are, defense of the arts and why art? Anyway, so, uh, so why art? And my response is, why not? Um, I th thought about this, and isn't it interesting? We don't really have, do we? Maybe we do. Some of you might know. Do we have anybody kind of defensing, uh, defending, like, why plumbing? Do we, like, defensive plumbing? That would actually might be interesting. To, or, you know, why food services? Um, or even philosophy. Philosophy's it's more like defending what philosophy more than whether you should have people thinking deeply about what's important in life. And of course, we don't have a lot of people needing to defend or public, uh, the meaning or purpose of sports or business. Uh, there might be conversations and debate about what kind of sports, what kind of business, or you know, things like that. But you never, you know, wh why? Why do, you even, why do we even have that? No, we have that. It's good to have business because Commerce creates um, wealth. It helps people be able to uh, trade and buy things and feed themselves. And uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, sports, um, competitive sports can be a, is a good thing. Uh, exercise of the body and interaction. Uh, a, a competitive aspect can actually help people be better at things that they do. So it, it's, but you never... It seems to me like the, the arts is another matter. Uh, there's always a need to defend it uh, because it's hard to understand and sometimes to explain. And the arts can sometimes seem superfluous, even useless. So 
Uh, what I hope I say tonight skirts some of that issue and gives a p possible reason why. Um, the talk tonight is actually, I'm going to confess to you, hey buddy, uh, love that guy, anyway, um, this is an ongoing conversation or talk that I have um, mostly in my head, but at times I've interacted with some of you about these things, um, and uh, whether in group discussions or in person, personally, or out on our porch or some social event, uh, sometimes we've gone deep or sometimes just skin uh, water skied over the top of things, but I hope that sharing some of this evolving conversation that goes on in my head that we can uh, become better at engaging a defense of the arts and that will reveal itself. So I'll be speaking for about 20 to 30 minutes and, and then we can have a short time of interaction if you like. But uh, my goal, and I, I won't necessarily clearly state these things, uh, I will try to, but there are basically three things I hope come out of this that I'm going to uh, mention either directly or indirectly, and that is that beauty uh, is real, but to a large degree it's undefinable. And I'll use other words to describe it. And uh, therefore, the second thing I'll say is that art, or the creative arts, is, is servant, is beauty's servant. I kind of see it as the vanguard for beauty. It should be the one that kind of tackles the real concept of what beauty can be hands-on as artists, whether it comes out in various aspects of visual art or even comes out in aspects of how one lives their life, because beauty is like that. It can not only, um, I'll be quoting her on other things, but Lane Scary talks about beauty can only be really um, seen in the particular. And um, I think that's, kind of, that's true, but it also, we use it as a way of describing how people live their lives like character in, in, so it's, it's an interesting word, but I will talk about how arts also, like beauty, though real, can also carry those same qualities of, I'm not sure I get that, that seems undefinable to me. And the third thing is, because of these characteristics, uh, I want to touch on, whether I touch on in this talk or at least the subsequent ones, that is, that beauty and therefore art actually make things valuable to life and community because it is real but also not d definable. And I'm going to have to talk that out probably not only tonight but in the future ones. Now the guide tonight are three quotes that I've really wrestled with for years and you have them in your hands. They're, these statements um, are always coming into and out of my thoughts as I wrestle with the idea of the importance of the arts community, and they will continue to do even after tonight. In fact, you guys are going to help me probably as we interact. And the first quote is actually Friday Arts Project's vision statement. The second is from a mid-20th century Catholic theologian, and the last is from a popular Hollywood movie. And um, let me take these one at a time. Uh, the vision statement. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them and then make some comments and then uh, of, over each of them and then and that will be the end of what I say of tonight and uh, then we can interact hopefully about that. Beauty exists where truth and goodness meet mystery. Art advances the celebration of this intersection. It's interesting as I was thinking about these three talks I had no intention to do this but what ended up happening was the content of them sort of began circling Friday Arts Project's vision, mission, and value statement. Mainly it's vision and mission. And I had no intention of doing that, but I found myself as I was thinking about the reason why. And so it just made sense for me to use Friday Arts Project's vision and mission. Uh, not just as a shameless plug for the organization, but uh, it's, it's also the reason why we do do the things that we do publicly and in these ways. So beauty exists, the vision statement, where truth and goodness meet mystery. Art advances the celebration of this intersection. So, beauty exists where truth and goodness meet mystery. Back before Sarah and I moved here 11 years ago, uh, Friday Arts Project was being run by volunteers, some even in this room, on their own dime and time. And what had started as a student organization at Winthrop University in 2006 continued even after those students graduated. And so, uh, Sarah and I had established a good relationship 
with some of those leaders and continue to do that even after keep those relationships up even after uh, they moved on. We had met in New York City over an arts project and, and we just kept those things up. Uh, mentoring, assisting, even with programming while Sarah and I lived in Orlando and I was doing some study in seminary. And uh, Rock Hill was halfway in, uh, from Florida to where my parents lived in Maryland so it was a natural place for Sarah and I to stop even for a short time. And we would do that and we'd plan it in such a way where we would stay for days at uh, a time at times to help with programming. And one of those things was um, the first forum they did in downtown Rock Hill on, uh, above one of, the, on one of the floors above Amelie's. And we did it on beauty and it was called Beneath the Surface in 2011. And I was going to do the, I did the final talk and as I was researching and reflecting on the definition of beauty on Ada, definition of beauty, I found that it was difficult to land on a clear definition uh, but I did find that one day, it, uh, did find one day that it was not so much a definition, but I was able to, I thought I came up with a pretty good location for where beauty can be found. If you, if you can't really clearly define it, where would, if you can't define it, where would you find it? Um, uh, I distinctly, um, I didn't do, I don't think I did too badly on the talk. I actually was rereading some of the stuff and I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Anyway, um, I need to reread some of that stuff. But uh, I distinctly remember being asked at the end of my talk to define beauty because I, I defined it. Um, well, to that, I restated my points uh, from the talk and took a few more questions, and we ended the time. And I, feel, I remember feeling a slight uneasiness about how I had responded to that question about defining beauty. Um, because in my preps for the talk, I'd relied on older defi oh, definitions of beauty that were pretty old, like Aquinas's uh, that which being seen pleases. That, um, that's something I've used, and we use. And I think it's a pretty good job of defining it. You see something, if it pleases you, that's beautiful. Um, that's not bad. He even wrote, wrote this, and this is a lot of people have used this. Uh, Jacques Maritain, I think, he was a mid-century, mid-20th century... <laughs> Catholic scholar, he said, he, um, he also adhered to this one from Aquinas, beauty must include three qualities, integrity or completeness, since things that lack something are thereby ugly, right proportion or harmony, and brightness. We call these, uh, we call things bright in color beautiful. Uh, and that, I thought that was a pretty good definition, actually. Um, but I wasn't completely satisfied because they seem to have, uh, all the definitions seem to have a level of a limitation to them and couldn't comprehensively define beauty. It was almost like, okay, we got to take a shot, so let's try and define it this way. And when it start getting outside those things, it, it didn't like it mean it undermined those definitions. It just seems they lo lost their oomph. And so that's why I sort of fell back on, well, where would you find it? Well... And I came up with that sentence, which is the first part of our vision statement, that beauty exists or resides where truth and goodness meet mystery. So my thinking was, if someone, an artist or a community, approaches the mysterious, and I'm defining the mysterious as, as a base definition, the unknown, what we, what we don't know. It's there, but we don't, we don't quite completely understand it. Uh, if you approach that, because you want to try and reveal some, you want to try and know some mystery, um, <coughs> that uh, if you do it truthfully and in a goodly manner, that's the moment that beauty has the most possibility of coming out. Um, whether it's a beautiful painting, a beautiful writing, even a beautiful life, a beautiful garden, if you approach, and approach things in a truthful manner about the way things grow and, you know, what should grow and better in certain sunlight and you do it in a goodly manner where you're caring for the plants in a manner. That's the most opportunity for something really beautiful to happen, even in one's actions as simple as a garden. Um, so, mystery having this noble, unknowable aspect to it 
I think is actually helpful for our human lives because mystery, big M mystery, has a kind of a push-pull to it. it you, we want to know more about it because it's unknown, but then it also has this aspect of like, well, you're not going to be able to know that. Um, so um, I think that that moment comes from somewhere beyond ourselves, something greater than ourselves. And uh, perhaps that's what I mean when I say beauty is real but not definable. Um, a couple last things before I move on to the next section um, of the, the vision statement. It won't take as long. Um, as I was thinking about this, we, we live with real things that we can't completely define or have undefinable aspects to them all the time. We live every day that way. Um, I was thinking about the, um, the love I have for my wife. It has things that are real that I see that we can grasp, uh, things like you know, service, uh, the physical hugs and kisses and affection, um, the joy, the, the, the feeling of um, uh, response when seen, or even uh, when you get angry, you're, you're angry because you love. <laughs> So there's real aspects, but try to tell me that I can completely define that whole love in one definition, or even completely define my wife, who is, even in the 16 years that we've been married, has changed too, just like I have. <laughs> so there's realness there, but I'm not able to completely define that. I can give words to it, like the definitions I just gave of beauty, but I don't know that it um, and that's actually an exciting thing because it ma actually uh, makes me gravitate towards my wife more and more because I want to know. The mystery, right? Push, pull. <laughs> it's pulling me closer, but it's also like, oh, I don't. So that's beauty exists for truth and goodness meet mystery. Now, art advances the celebration of this inter intersection. Um, as I said, I think art is kind of the, the vanguard for the idea of beauty, a pursuit of beauty. It's not the only thing. You can find beauty in other parts of life. But I think the, the, the arts and the creative arts in general, whether it's writing, story, poetry, um, creation of uh, visual items, uh, or even uh, things like music and dance, um, whether they would state it or not, I think their attempt is to try and grasp some of what is beautiful and express it in some way so that, one, the artist can be satisfied, and two, the community can be inspired or even engaged with or challenged. Um, so art is the servant of beauty. It seeks to find it and even help it if it can. Um, And, but it's not always successful. This, when I was thinking about this part, um, Elaine Scarry's uh, part of her book, uh, Beauty, uh, Beauty on, on Beauty and Being Just, she opened it up, the first section, talking about how Wittgenstein, the, the philosopher Wittgenstein said that when the, eye see, when the eye sees something beautiful, the hand wants to draw it. And uh, it reminded me, I'd heard a story about a young Leonardo da Vinci. I, I think this is part of his lore. But there are stories of him when he saw a beautiful face in like a woman or a child and mother, he would follow them around. He became a stalker. He would follow them around and try and draw them, sometimes well into the night. Um, you know, that's that, wow, I gotta you know, let's draw that. Um, but she also said this, um, she wrote this, beauty brings copies of itself into, into being. You could say that that was art. Art, the response is, a copy could be art. It makes us draw it, take photographs of it, or describe it to other people. Sometimes it gives rise to exact replication, other times to resemblances, and still other times uh, to things whose connection to the original site of inspiration is unrecognizable. What is she saying? She's saying there are varying degrees of how we encounter beauty and how we work it out and how we talk about it or express it or even work art pieces out. Sometimes they're exact replications. Um, 
photorealistic stuff, or even photograph it. You, you, that's what I was trying to get that moment. Um, I took a photo of it. Sometimes it resembles something, so you see the realness of it. And I would think of slight abstractions, like some of the impressionistic aspects, some of um, even my wife's art. It re leans realistic, but it also has this abstraction to it. And then she says sometimes the expressions are just not recognizable. And that's where it gets um, diluted, I think, because that's where people have the most problem. Well, if it's not recognizable, how do I know it's connected to that? And that's a legitimate question. Right here in this statement, uh, scary, as we can see uh, uh, from this, is a, a little bit of the interaction of truth and goodness with mystery, where we can understand some things, but not in the same way every time. Like, I would say the things that aren't necessarily recognizable would be some of the art, uh, the abstract art, like uh, like Mako's art, which we've talked about here in our community, Mako Fujimura. Um, even some of like Bruce Herman's art. Um, though you see real figures, there's a lot of abstraction. You know, we're going to be doing a, a there's going to be a symposium up here up the road at Gordon Conwell with uh, Ed Nippers, which has realism, but it's very abstract and. Uh, so, but art by, um, by trying to um, make it, work it, we are advancing it. We are celebrating it. Celebration assumes a level of intimacy, but it also assumes a level of love. And so when you celebrate something, you're kind of affirming that. You kind of want that to advance. Um, we all celebrate certain things. We, we hang flags out on our, uh, outside of our homes. We uh, put bumper stickers on our car because we're trying to celebrate, kind of um, advance that. And so I think that's what I mean by art advancing that. And all that happens at that intersection of truth and goodness meeting mystery. It can also bring collision and difficulty, but it can also bring wonderful growth, which we've also seen here in our community. Now, on to the second er, quote here. Uh, this is uh, Father Hans Urs von Balthasar. I've used this before. You, uh, you know about this, and this is one I've thought about for a long time. He's a mid-20th century uh, Catholic theologian. I think he lived in Switzerland. Um, I haven't read a lot of his stuff, but this is the one that has had the most impact on me. So this is a part of the full quote, but Beauty dances as an uncontained splendor around the double constellation of the true and the good and their inseparable relation to one another. Beauty is the disinterested one, no longer loved and fostered by religion. Beauty is lifted from its face like a mask and its absence exposes features on that face which threaten to become incomprehensible to man. Our situation today shows that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. And she will not allow herself to be separated or banned from her two sisters without taking them along with herself in an act of mysterious vengeance. So there are two kind of things that Balthazar, I think, is doing here. One is the first sentence there, from, which ends kind of with beauty is the disinterested one. He's kind of stating what he thinks is true of beauty. He's, he's kind of trying to give it some level of definition. Uh, I'll go back over these a little bit. And, and riff off of them. Uh, beauty's an uncontained splendor. It's, it's orbiting a double constellation of the true and the good. This is, you can see where I got my statement from. It's an inseparable relation, and beauty's disinterested. Seems kind of, seems kind of st stoic. <laughs> Why are you going? Anyway, and then the second section, the rest of the stuff, he, uh, Balthazar kind of says what he thinks are the evidences of what happens if people don't believe that about beauty, if they don't believe the first stuff, this is kind of what will happen, which is an interesting thing. It was, uh, let me go into some of these things. And this was probably, these are probably the two statements that kind of make me lean towards the undefinability to a large degree of beauty. It's an uncontained splendor, according to Balthazar, and it's the disinterested one. Um, notice it's orbiting truth and goodness. It's the one he it seems to say that is moving. The other two are kind of 
when we look at constellations, they're usually far off stars. And the way he's kind of saying it is, it seems like beauty's kind of like the comet that's flying, <laughs> only this comet's going around these two constellations of, of goodness and, and beauty, or goodness and truth. Um, so that's what got me thinking like, well, it seems like if you would try and grab it, it's going to move. And being disinterested means it would take a long, hard, long road to try and attract its attention. That is of beauty to a level. And uh, so that, at the same time, Balthazar is making a statement of what he thinks beauty is. Uh, um, first, he personifies beauty into a sister. It's interesting that they're related, they're, they're relatives. Um, and that uh, we find out what would happen to that relationship if a community or society or a culture no longer respected, interacted with in meaningful ways beauty, and you see that what would happen here. Um, he talks about, he starts with religion now as a Catholic theologian, of course he would start with religion, and, and I do too as, as a fellow Christian, but I think this is something that potentially the culture has done for a long time, where they've made beauty merely a mask, they've made it shallow, we've made it shallow, and therefore, Balthazar says she becomes a threat because she'll come and take her two sisters with her, take them away. Now, the first time I started interacting with this quote, I started doing some research on the idea of beauty because I, you know, come across Elaine Scarry's book, and that's all about. That was written all about, you know. They didn't want her to use the word beauty in, in aesthetics philosophy classes to teach it. They wanted her to use justness, just, justice. So I began to do some research in the history of kind of this concept and idea of beauty. It was interesting that back in the 90s, it started making a little bit of a return, meaning they, some of the critics had realized that the idea of engaging with beauty in the arts was lacking. It wasn't really around. And so they started doing some conferences and trying to come up with the definitions of beauty. And I don't think uh, there was a lot that came out of that uh, from what I remember of, that, of, of my research. But it is interesting that they made an observation like, hey, we haven't really done much with beauty. Maybe that's kind of the problem. And uh, uh, as a result, here we are uh, decades later and uh, we have a lot of division, we have a lot of hopelessness, a lot of meaninglessness. We have a lot of talk about my truth, your truth, <laughs> what is actually good. Some people who think certain things are good, other people, no, that's evil. We have a lot of division and a lot of different ideas in a more intense way than ever before. It's always made me think, is this the result of not really respecting beauty and therefore really, even in the arts, treat it in a way that could practically express it to encourage a community that would unify, but now we're experiencing a division because beauty's come back and had her vengeance. She's taken her two sisters with her. I don't know, it's something I've, I've been thinking about and will continue thinking about. Um, I'll leave that there for now. now. Now, let me get into the last thing here about the Ocean's Eleven quote. I just love, first of all, I just love this movie. Um, I think it, there's just something about all the ones of the Ocean's movies. It, you can just, feels like they were just having fun making them. It was just, and that kind of comes through in the, in the story. It's, it's not in depth, but it's just well done in many ways. And there's, this is one of my favorite moments, and I haven't forgotten about it, you know, uh, Danny and Rusty, uh, Danny Ocean and Rusty Ryan are the best friends, and they're the leaders. And um, they're sitting in front of a closed ca uh, clo uh, camera TV, looking at their friend Livingston Dell, their mercurial kind of nervous friend, as he's going in the back room, back hallways of the of the casino to put in, you know, the technology so they can spy and do their do their thievery. 
and they're sitting there watching him walk the hallways. And Danny, uh, George Clooney says, why do they paint the hallways that color? <laughs> and Rusty says, they say taupe is very soothing. I, 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 this past week, I decided to, I uh, typed in on a search, taupe is soothing. And what came up was a, one of the a links that came up, I clicked on it, was um, a Better Homes and Garden article that said, turn your bedroom into a dreamy oasis. Taupe is a natural, earthy shade that evokes a sense of calm and security. These qualities make it an ideal color for places intended for relaxation, like a bedroom. So, so with this quote, I'm kind of following a little bit of something that Wesley Vanderluck did with his book reading. When he read, if you remember, he read off that list of things of what would it be like if the world didn't have these things. And he was listing off all these things that are quite beautiful. I, I don't remember it all. I haven't read it in some days. It's like rainbows and like waterfalls. And I think he was getting more um, human act uh, oriented too. So I'm kind of following that list, but I want to go at the list from the opposite direction, uh, from the direction of Danny Ocean and Rusty Ryan, of why do they paint the hallways that color? Like in art, besides just color, like taupe, there are other factors that contribute to the way a piece, a piece of art looks. There's texture and tone and composition. Now, instead of imagining a world without the things like Wesley did, which I think is a, is a, is a pretty good list, imagine a world where taupe is the color of everything. I mean everything. Like the walls, the streets, the roofs, uh, even water and sunlight. Imagine just that all being taupe. Uh, everything you're wearing, the chairs you're sitting in, the room, it would kill my wife. But all these walls, they're all just taupe. First of all, it would be trying to get it soothing us. But I think it would also be kind of maddening, wouldn't it? I mean... Maybe even dangerous. I mean, how would you judge depth if everything was monochromatic? Um, there was more, nothing more than one color, the soothing color of taupe. You even have to kind of say it that way in deep voice, the soothing color of taupe. But not only that, imagine if everything were the same texture. Texture and pieces are like encaustic where, you know, the, the medium, whether it's uh, acrylic or oil or something else or putty, is lifted off and it's undulations. So imagine just one type of texture. <laughs> Again, you know, how imagine, would your sense of feel? That would be nothing. So we'd be blind and then we would be like, I can't feel anything else but just this, this feeling of this texture. So right there, a, a differentiation of color draws contrast and seems to help with living. If you had more than just one color, you, you could then begin to maybe perceive depth and shadow. I mean, even being soothed, it's... Um, taupe is not a bad color. I'm not trying to dis taupe. This taupe be a, I just thought I was, so anyway, I'm not trying to, I think being soothed by color is not a bad thing. It has its appropriate place. Um, if you want it in your bedroom, it seems like an appropriate, what's the color they usually suggest for um, kitchens? It makes you hungry. Is it yellow? Is it, there's a, there's a red, I, I think there's a color. So even with that, it, it's kind of interesting that Colors will be associated with triggering something in the human mind. And uh, so when we're out in our community, it is actually good that we have text different textures and different colors. It ha helps us live. It actually brings interest. And I think one of the reasons why it's a valuable thing for our community is, is that it places us in a hum potentially in a humble place to be able to engage with that which we don't know, the mysterious, and perhaps hopefully uh, live our lives similarly, humbly, but also curiously. Um, that I hope would make us 
better people as a result. So to go back to my initial summary of the three things, I think uh, talking about beauty is real, but it's ultimately undefinable, intentionally so, and I think for, for our good, that art uh, echoes that, creative arts, anything with even minor, what we would consider minor, like crafting uh, things of, of art would carry us into that same zone about inviting us to consider what is mysterious. And then as a result of that, that brings value to our life because it has high potential of helping us judge the world rightly. Um, uh, even as simple in that example of, I'm glad everything is not made of taupe. 